I'm going to try that again. So welcome, everyone, to the Charlotte Congregational Church. Those of you who are welcoming or worshiping at home with a blanket and a hot cup of coffee, you may be the smart ones, um, but we are thrilled to be here together on this wonderful, rainy, real fall day. And a special welcome this morning to members from the Vermont Symphony Orchestra who are here uh, Jonathan Brin and Wung Klo Soon and Jane Kittredge and Russell Wilson. So uh, it is a blessing to have you with us. So everyone, remember that no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, no matter what you believe or what you question, where you've been or who you love, here with us, may you find safety and a sanctuary for your soul. We have um, a we continue our stewardship uh, campaign now, and to speak to us this morning, we have Matilda and Russ McCracken. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Russ McCrack, and I'm the church's financial steward for this year. Uh, and this is my assistant this morning, uh, Matilda, also known as Harry Potter's friend, Dobby the house elf. And this is an exciting day, right? Right. And do you know why? It's Halloween. N well, no, well, it is. But what makes this day really exciting is that it's time for a financial stewardship update. Well, the church's 2022 uh, stewardship campaign is underway, and uh, thank you, a special thank you so much to those who have pledged already. Um, the contribution allows the church to continue its great work through next year. Uh, I encourage you to take a look uh, through the narrative budget and consider returning a pledge card by November 14th. Um, all pledges are a very important part of uh, supporting the church and its work and um, everything, that we, everything that we do here and enabling that to continue through another year. The theme this year is inspired by love and Matilda, or Dobby, is gonna help this morning to talk about what the church means to our family and how we feel inspired by love. So, Dobby, I know usually you get to ask the questions in these interviews, but today I thought I'd let you answer the questions. Over the past couple of years that we've been part of the church community, what have been your favorite aspects? My favorite part has been going to Sunday school with my friends. I like playing outside and doing crafts and getting to know Hadley and everyone else. Oh, that's great. Is there anything particular, any special Sundays that stand out that were really fun? Um, the last Children's Sunday, because we got to leave the church. Yes, and you did it so successfully, right? Well, that's great, Dobby. Is there anything else? Coffee hour. Coffee hour. What's your favorite part of church? I thought I was asking the questions this morning. Oh, okay. Well, Matilda, Dobby, my favorite part is the wonderful, close, and supportive community that we all have built as, as a part of this church. 
Well, we've all been inspired by love. Oh. And speak of inspired by love, your character this morning has a bit of that in, in its story, doesn't it? I tried to save Harry Potter's life, sir, many times, sir. And then Harry Potter set Dobby free, sir. Oh, well, thank you for that, Dobby and Matilda. And thank you all for your support of the church. Happy Sunday. And happy Halloween.
So let's join together now in our opening prayer and the Lord's Prayer. It will be um, projected on the walls and it's in your bulletin. Let us pray. O oh God, set your blessing upon us as we begin this day together. Confirm in us the truth by which we might rightly live. Confront us with the truth from which we wrongly turn. We ask not for what we want, but for what you know we need as we offer this day and ourselves for you, praying together. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so as we come to our time of offering this morning, I just want to remind you that there are plates at both doors of the sanctuary, and you're welcome to put in an offering um, as you come or go, and you can also give online, and we have a barcode on our um, bulletin as well. So we are just so grateful for the support that this church has been given, and my feeling about giving to the church is kind of the way this sanctuary is right now. It should come in one door, and it should go out the other. Um, so we sort of live in being the channel for giving and love and sharing. So let us pray. Dear God, receive the offerings that we give this morning and this afternoon and on Wednesday and Thursday and throughout the week. Inspire us to be channels for your love, that what gifts we have may spread out to those in need. We give you thanks for all that you have given us, but mostly for our ability to give to others. Amen. Thank you. 
words seem a little flat after that. <laughs> so let us pray. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So the book of Ruth is a literary masterpiece. It is succinct and beautiful and fraught with tension, resolution, love, sex, and despair. Never in the Jewish tradition is it ever read piecemeal. You hear the whole book or you hear none of it at all. So in the interest of being fair to the traditions that honor it, I'm going to tell you the story and then look more closely at the first chapter, which is prescribed for our text today. As you hear it, keep in mind the patriarchal nature of ancient Israel. Not only is it surprising that the main characters in the story are women, it's kind of amazing it's canonized in our Bible at all. It is, as the, as the theologian Phyllis Tribble says, a story of women working out their salvation with fear and trembling. Watch also for God's presence. How great a part does, Yah does Yahweh play in this tale? To understand the story, it's helpful to be aware not only of the patriarchy, but also the racism that was prevalent at the time, as well as the abhorrence of all foreigners. Were I to read the book rather than tell it, you'd find it confusing keeping track of where Moab is, who's Gentile, who's Jewish, so I'll change it around a little and give it a more contemporary setting. The countries will be Mexico and the United States, but I'll keep the names of the people and the thrust of the story the same. Okay, so once upon a time, in a warm and fertile land of Mexico, there lived a woman named Naomi. She had a husband named Elimelech, and they were the proud parents of two boys named Chilion and Melan. To have two sons in Mexico was to have a quiver full of arrows, as the psalmist said. As our story begins, Mexico has been experiencing severe effects of climate change, and the once fertile land is beset now alternately with floods and with droughts. Elimelech and Naomi have struggled for years to reap a living from the barren land, and after much prayer and consideration, they decide to emigrate to the land of promise, the United States. It isn't easy crossing the border, and after many false starts, they arrive. But Elimelech dies shortly after they get there, and Naomi is now left a widow with no money and dependent on her sons, who, as luck would have it, fall in love with two gorgeous American women named Ruth and Orpah. Naomi remains an illegal alien. And she lives in fear, ducking for cover whenever the authorities approach. To make matters worse, within 10 years of their arrival in the United States, both of her sons die. And now, Naomi is left with her two daughters-in-law. Naomi, who had seemed so full, so rich, as she called herself in her homeland, is now empty. Without any men in her life, without any education or property, she has little chance for survival, and she decides to return to Mexico, where the weather has been cooperating and the crops are flourishing. And she hopes that her husband's family will take care of them. So Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah set out on the long trip home to Mexico. But sitting in a bus station, where they've spent the, the night, Naomi comes to the realization that she just cannot take her daughters-in-law with her. At five in the morning, 
stiff from trying to sleep on plastic chairs, she entreats them in a chatter of argument to stay in their own country with their families where their chances of remarrying are great. Exhausted and sick of arguing, Orpa finally agrees to stay in the United States. But Ruth refuses, and she chooses instead to accompany Naomi to a land she has never seen, where she will be greeted in all likelihood with hostility and reproof. When Naomi and Ruth finally arrive in Mexico, hungry and filthy and tired, Naomi sends Ruth out into the fields to try and gather some barley that the threshers have left on the ground so they could have something to eat that night. While in the field, as luck would have it, Ruth is spotted by a member of her hu husband's family, a fellow named Boaz. Boaz takes, as they say, a shining to Ruth immediately and orders his threshers to make sure that there's a lot of barley left on the ground. He clearly knows who she is, and he is very grateful for all that she has done for Naomi. When Ruth returns home in the evening, Naomi is astounded by all of the grain that she has gathered and asks where she's been. And Ruth tells her about Boaz. And, Ruth, and Naomi exclaims, Blessed be he by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living and the dead. The man is a relative of ours, our nearest kin. So this connection with Ruth's dead husband assured them security, for the nearest relative was to marry the widow. Sensing that all is not lost, Naomi has Ruth wash herself, anoint herself with oil, put on her most fetching attire, and go to Boaz in the evening when he is lying down to sleep. The scripture says that Naomi entrusts Ruth to uncover his feet. But the Hebrew word for feet also refers to a far more private part of the male anatomy. Ruth does, they do, and the next day, Boaz sets about trying to tidy up the technicalities that will make Ruth his wife. This accomplished, they are married. Ruth gives birth to a son, and as you saw in the front of your bulletin, she gives the baby to Naomi to care for. And the son's name is Obed, and he was the grandfather of David, Israel's greatest king. Well, that's the plot. Where's the story? Let's go back to the bus station. Naomi is downtrodden and destitute. Feeling that the hand of the Lord has turned against her, she's bitter and she's forsaken. You get the feeling that as she heads back to Mexico, she hardly notices that her daughter-in-laws are tagging behind. But waking from a night of little sleep with cold coffee in her hand and furry teeth, Something pulls her out of her self-absorption to think about her daughters-in-law and their welfare. She's impatient and paints a bleak picture of their prospects if they go to Mexico. Orpa finally agrees to leave Naomi, for though Orpa's heart is beating with love, behind Ruth's is a heart that is breaking, wrapped with love, sinking in despair, and torn by apprehension. How do we know this? Because it is here in this scene of tears, in a filthy bus station, that Ruth turns to Naomi and utters the words which have made her immortal. If you're like me, you were probably surprised the first time you realized that this love poem was from one female relative to another, a testimony of love that has hardly been equaled since. I'm going to read the King James Version because I think it has a certain majesty lacking in subsequent editions. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. 
Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee from me. It's a confession, an unconditional promise. Ruth says nothing either before or after in that poem in the book that is of any real consequence, certainly nothing that begins to touch the beauty. This is her mark, and it has branded many of us deeply. Imagine loving someone that much, giving so completely to another that in some sense you are no longer your own. You have lost yourself to someone else. The irony is that as Ruth gives herself unequivocally to Naomi, she is found. She emerges as a person of majesty and wonder. When Ruth delivers her covenant of love, when she hangs her poem on the wings of eternity, we sit right up and we take notice. And you can be sure that Naomi did too. But what does Naomi say in response to Ruth? Absolutely nothing. Here's Naomi, who has just been chattering away and arguing with Ruth and Orpah, and she's gotten sarcastic and cross in an effort to make them leave her, then boom, silence. What do you think was going through her mind? Was she shaking her head and thinking, ay caramba, now we are two forsaken widows instead of one, and to make matters worse, one of them will be a foreigner. Ruth's poem gives me the goosebumps, but Naomi's silence stuns me. How would you respond if someone said that to you? What if the person saying it were not your partner, not the one to whom you've pledged your troth, but your niece, or your brother, or your son, or your friend, or your daughter-in-law, not someone to whom you are romantically attracted, just someone who loves you, more than anyone ever has. It comes out of nowhere. It hits you broadside, and it takes your breath away. What can you say in the face of such love and commitment? As Naomi found, it's hard to say anything at all. The whole idea of silence is one that, for the most part, is alien in our culture. It's sometimes very difficult not to say something. How many times has someone you care for been dealt a mortal, horrible blow, and you're in a quandary as to what to do. You say to yourself, well, I'd like to go visit, but I, I really don't know what to say. Behind this, of course, is the fear that we all share of saying the wrong thing, of inadvertently putting salt in a separating wound. We might take a clue here from Ruth Ruth doesn't say that she's going to make it all right. She doesn't throw a Pollyanna cast on Naomi's plight. She doesn't try to cheer her up. What she says is that she will be with Naomi no matter what. She will be present regardless of what transpires. She was probably about 16 and, not, and didn't have an inordinate amount of wisdom. In her youth, and in her insecurity, Ruth just promises to be there. In the end, it's the greatest blessing of all. Sometimes we trivialize the importance of being present with someone. We think that we have to be clever or wise or upbeat. It takes a long time to realize that it's okay to say nothing at all, to feel comfortable just sitting or standing. I learned this the hard way, which seems, unfortunately, the way we all learn things best. One frigid January night, when I was in my 30s, and the temperature was also in the 30s, below zero, the phone rang. In those dark and still hours, it only rings to spread disaster. My best friend's husband had just died shockingly and suddenly in the bed beside her. 
In the ensuing years, we pretty much blended our families. Her people became our people, and our people became hers. One image that is seared in my memory is the picture of the two of us sitting on the couch in her living room in the weeks that followed his death. The rare and crisp winter sun cast light in a house cloaked in darkness. For hours, we sat side by side in silence, trying to swallow saltines that tasted like sawdust. I remember thinking at first, this is kind of strange. We aren't saying anything. But honestly, what could be said? We had been the best friends before, but from then on, we were, well, wed is the word that comes to mind. Though we're no longer neighbors and don't see each other often, we connect twice a day, once in the morning and once at night, by playing words with friends and sending brief text check-ins. We're still sitting on the couch. Remember what I said for you to watch out earlier? God. Wait, God. God. Is God even in this story? No miracles happened. God doesn't utter a peep. Smack in the center of the Old Testament is a little book that hardly mentions Yahweh at all. And yet it seems to me that Ruth's love for Naomi is about as divine as it gets. We're all recipients of God's unconditional and complete love wherever we go, wherever we lodge. God's love is moving around and through us all the time, but mostly we don't recognize it. Have you noticed God in your story lately? And there are Ruths all around us, laughing at our side, waiting to be allowed in. And there are Naomi's sitting down the pew or staring at their computers in the next room or teaching in the classroom across the hall or lying in our beds on the other side of a text message, looking back at us from the mirror. These Naomi's may have chipped exteriors, but they are really empty bowls waiting to be filled. May we offer to one another and to God our steadfast love and our deepest pain that we too might be filled with a cup of blessing, grace, and peace. And now the song um, that they are going to play is a hymn called When Love is Found, and I just want to remind you, the words are going to go up on the wall, and you have them in your bulletin, just because these words, I think, are important, but we're not singing yet, so try not to sing in your heart and in your mind.
I just want them to keep going. <laughs> um, so a couple of announcements at the end of the service. Um, first, Kevin, as you might have surmised, is on vacation, but he will be back uh, tomorrow, and we hope that he's had a wonderful time in New York City. Yes, great time, Deirdre says, wonderful. Um, and he will be preaching next week. Um, Jim, did you have an announcement? It's on. Is it on? It's on, Deirdre. Yep, you're good. Good morning, everybody. Is, is, it, is the microphone on? Yeah. Keep it um, close to you. Hang, Deirdre. Okay. So I'm Jim Hyde from Mission, and I just wanted to remind you that as part of our partnership with Jump, the Joint Global Phoenix Project. It's not coming through real well, Deirdre. How's that? Does that sound better? that we're participating with JUMP. Uh, we've been asked to participate in the Laundry Voucher Program. And you'll remember Francis Foster's, I won't, I won't attempt to reprise your uh, act last week, Francis, when she very dramatically brought her laundry basket here and shared her dirty laundry with us all. It may seem like a trivial thing, but um, for people who are living at the margins, people who are homeless, people whose lives um, don't have a lot of luxuries in them, doing laundry is really important. And so um, it's not too late to donate to this program if you haven't. There are lots of ways to donate. Donate. You can use the uh, voucher, uh, the uh, envelopes at the, end of, at the back of the church. You can write a check and just write jump in the memo line. Uh, and we'd be grateful for that. And also, there's an opportunity still to, if you wish, to purchase Norm Kurtz's book, Curbing Across America in the Age of Innocence. We sold 14 of them last week, um, and he, we're going to donate $20 for every book um, that we sell. I'll be in the back of the church if you're interested, and I'd be happy to take your orders. Thank you very much. You want to give that right over there to Lewis? Uh, hi, everyone. Is this, this is on? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Lewis Mudge here. Um, just a very quick plug. Thank you so much, Susan, for letting me come up. Um, I'm on the board of an organization. I was in the Peace Corps 20 years ago, and we have an organization called the Lesotho Connection. Um, I posted on Front Porch Forum. I'll be doing it again this week. Um, but we are having a fundraiser next week. Um, and uh, in that fundraiser, all the proceeds are going to be going to an organization in Lesotho. This is a tiny little country in southern Africa. Um, that was ravaged by the HIV and AIDS pandemic uh, and still continues to be so. Um, and in the fundraiser, there's also an opportunity to watch a great film on Lesotho, which is free, so you don't have to pay to, to, to participate and watch the movie. And on Sunday, so a week from today, um, at 7 p.m., um, we'll be doing a Q&A. Uh, I'll be leading it on Zoom, so you can get a Zoom link. Um, and the director is actually my brother. Uh, so it's quite cool. Um, so you can um, participate, ask some questions um, as well. So if you do have some space for giving, we'd love to get um, those donations. But even if you don't and just want to learn more about Lesotho, um, please drop in on Sunday on Zoom and, and participate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lewis, for this great work. Um, so I haven't mentioned personally, I haven't mentioned Halloween, but I just want to say I'm getting a little scared because I have, what is it called, an acrophobia. And acrophobia. I don't like spiders at all. And it looks to me like there are a lot of spiders in the back of our church. <laughs> it is, however, I so love seeing the kids in the balcony. It is a great treat. So this day, be not afraid, but go in peace to your bus station, to your couch, to some place unexpected where you can open your heart for love. Amen. And now as we do our blessing, I, uh, what we used to do for those of you who are new is we would stand up and sing this blessing to each other. Um, they are going to play it through twice. I still invite you to stand up and look around at your neighbors 
um, and just send blessings to those you see.